Thank you so much, and thank you for inviting me again today to speak to you. Um, I'm really excited that this time I can actually talk to you about some results that have been translated to patients. And some of you may have on your chairs some little flyers about a trial that we're running at the Perron Institute. And what I'm going to tell you about today is some of that basic research that led to the trial that we're running at the moment. So I am a neuroscientist. I do basic research in trying to understand how the brain works. So from that sort of research that I do to getting into the clinic to treat patients, it's a really long journey. And that's why I titled this talk an unexpected research journey, because really I want to understand about the brain and a fantastic benefits that come out of that amazing sort of research that we do as a, a huge team at the Perron is that we can then benefit patients and find new treatments for a range of disorders. So my research is into brain plasticity. What is brain plasticity? I have used the analogy before of a large city. The brain is like a large city. There are some parts of that city that are very busy and that have a lot of roads that carry information and you can get from one part to another. There are other parts of the city, or perhaps if we extend to a country, that are, are a lot quieter, and you really just want to get from point A to point B with no distractions and um, other sort of branch points on the way. Like any city, the brain is often changing. So every experience we have, every time we learn something new, the brain has to change those roads so that we can get from point A to new point B. And that's really what brain plasticity is all about. It's the ability to change in response to the um, experiences and the influences of the environment around us. However, it is also important to have that plasticity if something goes wrong. So if the brain is injured, if we have a neurological condition that damages parts of the brain, just like when the train lines shut down, we need to be able to get bus routes in there to get around that injury site to compensate for the changes that mean that function isn't working the way it should. So brain plasticity is not just about sustaining the brain so that it works perfectly throughout our life. It's about being able to repair and compensate when the brain doesn't work. So let me push that analogy a little bit further. I'm a neuroscientist. I want to understand how that actually works in the brain. So if I were a builder, I'd want to know what goes into building those roads. And as you can see, this is a Google search of an image, how do I build a road? Because I have no idea I'm a neuroscientist, not a civil engineer. You know, there are all of these layers of gravel and soil and sand, and then you've got to put the bitumen on top, and you've got to get all of the, the tubes for, I assume, water and gas and electricity for the headlights. It's really, really complicated. So there are all of these bits that you need to bring together. And if you're a good road builder, you then make it look beautiful with trees and you know, parks along the sides so that that road functions to the best of its possible ability. Well, the brain is exactly the same. You have a lot of components that you need to put together in a certain way in order for those brain pathways to work. And the reason I'm telling you about this is because the research that I do initially was really interested in these neurons. Everybody knows about neurons. They're the ones in the brain that transmit the electrical activity. They transmit the information from one bit to another. People think of them as being the heavy lifters of the brain. But in fact, they're also supported by astrocytes, which are cells that support those neurons. They give them the chemicals and the energy and the support that they need to do their job. And very important to all of us in this room are the oligodendrocytes, which are the ones that wrap around the neurons and provide the insulation for them to work and faster and talk to each other a lot faster. And in multiple sclerosis, it's these cells that are really at risk and that we need to make sure that we save them and encourage them to do their job in supporting this amazing road work network in the brain. So my research is about understanding how to harness brain plasticity. How can we make the brain build better pathways? How can we make it compensate after injury? How can we make the brain work better and be much more flexible in response to this very challenging environment that we live in? And while I talk to you about this, keep in mind that all of the brain cells, not just the neurons that we always think of first, all of the brain cells are likely to be involved in brain plasticity. So one of the techniques that I've used, and I've spoken to many of you in this room before in previous years, is uh, electrical stimulation of the brain. 
And this is a really powerful technique because the brain works by using electricity to transmit information. So if we can get electrical signals inside the brain, that can help us to amplify those neural signals and make them stronger and eventually be able to manipulate them so that they work a lot better and we can start to drive plasticity in the way that we want it to. So we don't plug people in. It's not direct electrical stimulation of the brain. What we do is we use a magnetic field, and that's what's illustrated over here. It's a coil in the shape of a figure of eight that has copper coil, copper wire, sorry, wound around in a circle. And when we pass an electrical current through that wire, it makes a magnetic field that can then activate the electrical circuits in the brain. So it's a really nice technique because it's non-invasive. There's no surgical procedure involved. And because the magnetic field goes straight through the brain and, sorry, straight through the skull and the skin, the brain receives that activation directly without any sensation. So it's a very simple technique to administer, and it's been used for a number of years, which is my next point, in um, inducing plasticity in the brain, so we know that it has an excellent safety profile. You may have heard of this technique as a treatment for depression because it's now on the Medicare benefit schedule in Australia since 2021, and it's approved for treating adults who don't respond to uh, antidepressant drugs. So it's very, very efficient in treating depression because of its ability to actually rewire the brain and to establish pathways that support posit positive mood and remove the pathways that are supporting negative moods. So, when I started researching this technique, my focus was very firmly on the neurons because they're electrically active. So if you're putting electrical currents into the brain, those neurons are likely to be the main ones that respond to those currents and have therapeutic outcomes. But as I started researching this, this tool, I thought this is really a bit narrow-minded. You know, there are lots of other cells in the brain. What's going on? So we next looked at the astrocytes because those are cells that we think are really important in the plasticity process. And we were really excited to discover that there were a number of effects on these astrocytes. But what I'm going to tell you about today is the effects of this magnetic field on the oligodendrocytes. And this is work that I carried out with Kayleen Young in Tasmania. And it's been a long and very, very fruitful collaboration that, as I say, has culminated in this clinical trial that I'm proposing to you today. So, just overall, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the process that we go through when we do research, because it's not easy, and it's full of surprises, it's a lot of fun, and you learn a lot of things on the way. I'm then going to give you some of the results that we found in our research about this brain stimulation technique and oligodendrocytes, and then I'm going to spend most of my time talking about our clinical trial, because I want to take you through the steps of what it actually involves, and hope that some of you in this room will be interested in participating in the trial. So let's start off with some surprises. So when we do research and we want to look at the cells in the brain, we obviously can't do that in people because we need to take the cells out and put them under the microscope. So a really key part of my research is doing preclinical studies in laboratory animals where we can look at individual cells and see how they work. I need to reassure you that mice and rats do have brains as well, and their brains may look a little bit different from our brains, but if you look inside them, look at the cells inside the brain, those cells do exactly the same things that our cells do. So all of the research that we can learn from these models, whether they be in animals, in cells that are taken out of the animals and grown in a dish, those are absolutely fundamental components of any sort of research that then leads to treatment in the clinics. So that's all very well and good, and I'm sure you're aware of the importance of basic research, but when you're trying to look at how a treatment works that is delivered in humans, and you have a machine that delivers stimulation that is this size, because our heads are this size, you then think about applying that stimulation to a mouse, and you have this problem of size, that mice are actually really, really small, and if we use these devices that are designed for humans to stimulate mice, you end up stimulating the whole body. And that's really not good practice if we're trying to understand how stimulation works in the brain. So I actually spent nearly five years developing miniaturized coils. And as I said, I'm a, I'm a neuroscientist, but I had to work with physicists, with engineers. I had to go to workshops and learn how to wind copper wire onto coils. I'll admit to you, and I think I've said this again before, these initial coils that we used were made on my sewing machine at home to try and wind bobbins of copper wire. So this period was really exciting because we were breaking new ground and trying to establish new tools 
to stimulate the brain that would allow us to understand how these things actually work and how we can apply them as treatments. And you can see that because of all the work we did, we got a number of publications. A number of my PhD students have gone on to establish successful careers based on this absolutely groundbreaking research. So now we've got these little tools. How do we use them? How do we use them to study oligodendrocytes? So we have our mice, their brains are full of oligodendrocytes, and we thought we just want to look at a normal animal and see what happens when we stimulate the brain. What, what do the oligodendrocytes do in response to that stimulation? So we delivered what we thought was a clinically relevant treatment, something that we know is safe in humans, but was perhaps a little bit different and adapted to the size of the brain that we had. So this is a daily stimulation. This particular frequency, the acronym ITBS, just means the pattern of stimulation that we give, and it lasts for about three minutes. And we delivered it on weekdays, because we know that doctors only like to work on weekdays. So weekdays, um, three minutes a day, over the top of the brain of this little mouse. And then we thought, well, how long do we deliver it for? We know that in depression, we need to deliver treatment for four weeks. But getting people to come in every day for four weeks is actually a big ask. So we thought, well, we'll try two weeks. We give them daily stimulation for two weeks. But oops, we'll also give them daily stimulation for four weeks, because we know that that's what's needed in depression, so let's play it safe. Um, at the end of the treatment, we would look inside the brains and look at the cells and see what's happened to those oligodendrocytes. I should also point out that we have TMS, which is this brain stimulation technique, but we also have a sham group because it's important to have controls so that we can compare our treatment against our controls. So to cut a very long story short, we found some really exciting findings. And these are pictures of what the oligodendrocytes look like. So in the top panel here, this is a sham treated mouse. And you can see in green, those are the oligodendrocytes. And in our control animal, you might see about five or six cells that are green. So there's a certain number of oligodendrocytes. But I hope that you can see in this TMS treated animal, there are more green cells and they're bigger and they're healthier. So that was a really, really exciting finding. We can quantify this. And let me take you through these two graphs. The top and bottom panel just refer to different brain regions. And we measured it in the cortex of the brain, which is in the surface bit. And you can see those little blue areas just refer to visual cortex or motor cortex. But the exciting thing is that you can see after two weeks, there was no difference between the sham and the treatment. It took 28 days or four weeks before we got that increase in cell numbers that you can see with the treatment. So this very simple experiment told us that we need four weeks of stimulation, and that when we deliver that to a healthy mouse, we get an increase in the number of oligodendrocytes. So I won't take you through all of the other data. I just thought it was really important to show you what we're actually doing and what it looks like. But briefly, we know that this brain stimulation increased the survival of the oligodendrocytes. We've done other experiments and showed that it doesn't actually cause the brain to make more of them, but it makes the ones that are already there healthier, so they resist any sort of inflammation or injury, and they make more myelin as well. Um, and as I showed you before, we need that four-week period in order to, to deliver the treatment. So in addition to the work that Kayleen Young and, uh, I had, and my lab had done on these oligodendrocytes, we sort of went back to the literature and said, somebody must have seen something like this before. <coughs> and when you look back at the literature of people who had received TMS for depression, the studies that look at their white matter in the brain using MRI actually showed more white matter in the brain. So it actually coincided with our results really well, showing that in humans, remember we had done mice, there's a, an indication that the same things might be happening in humans. So this is really interesting and really important because it shows that TMS can actually target myelination. And this basic research project that came out of a pure curiosity-driven question, what does TMS do to oligodendrocytes, has led to a translatable program that goes from the bench, from the lab, into the clinic. And TMS is a really exciting example of this because, in fact, it started off in people. And then we've taken it back into the lab to find out how it works. 
And because of that, we've been able to go back into people and discover a whole new application where we can treat a range of different disorders. So that this is what's called the virtuous circle in research because the idea is you keep going round and round and round because every time you pass through the clinic or the lab, you discover new information that can lead to benefits all around. So let me tell you about what we've done with this basic research finding. We have decided to take it through to a clinical trial and it's been extremely successful so far. So the trial is called TORUS, which is a rather creative acronym for magnetic brain stimulation for multiple sclerosis clinical trial. I've always used the acronym TMS because it's transcranial magnetic stimulation. But in some of the literature around this trial, you'll, you might see MBS, which is magnetic brain stimulation. Essentially, they're the same. It's just a difference in nomenclature to make it easier to follow. MBS is much more relatable, I think, in terms of magnetic brain stimulation. I apologize, I'm old school. I'll use TMS throughout the rest of the presentation. So when we design a clinical trial, I'm sure you're aware that there are a number of steps. And the first step is to see if it's safe. So as I mentioned, we know that TMS is safe because it's been used for nearly 40 years in people, particularly in a context of depression. But we didn't know if it was safe in people with MS because the populations of depression and the population of MS, although there may be some overlap, there's clearly a difference between those populations. So phase one is the first step to see if it's safe. And TORUS-1 was a trial that was designed to do that. It was tested in only 20 people and they looked for whether the people who received magnetic brain stimulation responded well to it, whether they had any side effects, whether it was safe. And that got a big tick. There were no safety concerns and no side effects and no uh, unexpected bad outcomes of the treatment. So that has now set the scene for Taurus 2, which is what we're running at the moment. And that's really important to test efficacy. We want to know if the trial actually works. If Taurus 2 is successful, then we'll move on to Taurus 3, where we'll be in a position to test magnetic brain stimulation against other treatments for MS to see which ones work better. But that's in the future. What I'm going to tell you about today is Taurus 2, which is essentially a trial that will see whether it works or not. So like I mentioned, when we did Taurus 1, we learned that, it was, that magnetic brain stimulation is safe, it's well tolerated, so people don't get headaches or muscle twitches or spasms. Or there, there are no side effects to come out of that initial safety trial. We did learn that although there was big time demand on people, it was every day for four weeks, people still could manage to come to all of those sessions and get the appropriate treatment. It was a big demand on their time, but it was feasible. And what was really important to us is that we had a control group that pretended to be a TMS treatment and the people who received that couldn't tell that they were getting a control. So it was a blinded study, and that's really, really important because we want to make sure that our placebo effects don't kick in, start to make us believe that we're getting benefits from the treatment. So what we didn't learn from Taurus 1 is also important. As I mentioned, we only had 20 people in this trial, so we were never going to be able to tell if the treatment worked or not. It was really just a safety and feasibility trial. Um, I'm very excited, we were all really excited when the results came out that it looked like there is an indication that it was going to start working, that people receiving magnetic brain stimulation did have more myelination in their brains, but there's nowhere near enough data to say that it was significant. And really this is a good outcome because this is what we wanted to get out of the trial. We just wanted the safety, tolerability and feasibility. So TORUS 2 takes that next step. And what we're going to do is enroll 108 people across Australia. It's not a big number, but this is the number that we think we're going to need to be able to indicate whether there is a significant effect of the treatment. And these words down the bottom here just mean that it's going to be held to the very highest possible standards of treatment. So all of the requirements for blinding you know, the participants, for blinding the clinicians, for making sure that we're doing this without bias. So it's one of the highest quality trials that we can do at this point. It's extremely well designed. The sites across Australia are spread out. Very, we're very proud to have a site here at the Perron Institute in Perth that we're running at the clinics. And we're a key part of this trial because obviously we were involved in those early discoveries. 
so what are the objectives of the trial? What our primary objective, which is you know, the fundamental outcome that we want to see from a treatment for MS, is that TMS will improve the functional outcomes of upper and lower limb function and brain function. And the secondary objectives are then very similar to the safety ones. Is it safe and tolerable? You know, does it improve quality of life? Do people feel better when they receive this stimulation? The tertiary objectives, and I'm not going to lie, this is what really interests me as a scientist, as a researcher, does it make more myelin in the brain? And we know from the animal studies, and there's a tendency from the depression studies as well, that there will be more myelin made in the brains of people who receive magnetic brain stimulation. And there are a number of other outcome measures related to myelin. Does it, you know, the amount of myelin, does it correlate to the improvement and various things like that. But basically for me, this tertiary objective is really going to determine whether this treatment is going to make a big impact on people's lives because it relates back to that biological aspect. So what does TMS actually involve? When you sit down, when you come in and you volunteer for the trial, um, you basically go through a series of screening tests and you do some basic behavioral tests that I'll come to in a minute. But the machine that delivers magnetic stimulation looks a bit like a desktop computer. It's just a big box that has a screen on it because that's how we control the parameters. The coil that delivers the stimulation looks like this. And it's a bit of an awkward picture, but you can see it sits over the head quite nicely. And there will be a person there who will be holding it over in the right position to make sure that it always targets the right location. The session takes about 15 minutes. So in a mouse, the coil that we had covered the entire part of the mouse's brain because the mouse is so small and we couldn't miniaturize our coils anymore. But in humans, what we find is we need to target one side of the brain first and then the other. And so that takes two times three minute sessions, one on each side. So overall, it's about 15 minutes. We then want to measure those functional outcomes that I mentioned before, and we do that by asking you to walk a 25-foot distance, and we time how long it takes you to do that. We also give you a, a fine motor test, putting little pegs in holes, and we can measure again how accurate and how much time that takes. And finally, there are some little puzzle tests where you need to uh, link numbers with symbols, and again, that's an accuracy and timed process as well. So we do those tests before and after the treatment, to assess any changes to function. The visits are very brief, as I mentioned before, because it's really only a 15 minute visit. You need to come into the Perron Institute, which is located on the QE2 hospital site, and there'll be an initial screening visit just to make sure that you're eligible and that it's safe for you and that you can meet the criteria of the study. Then daily visits, Monday to Friday for four weeks, which is the big impost on your time. And if you miss a session, it's possible to make it up as long as all of your sessions are completed within, I think it's a five to six week period. So there is some flexibility if something comes up on a particular day. We then want to have a three month follow up visit with you where we just make sure that any benefits might have been sustained. And the key, again, outcome measures that I'm interested in those MRI scans that will tell us if you've got more myelin than when you started the trial. So the flyers that I've put out on the chairs, I encourage you to take them with you and share them with anybody you think might be interested. And that summarizes the eligibility criteria and there's a contact email and phone number. And we'd love to hear from you because we're really just starting up this trial and it's a really exciting opportunity for the uh, MS community. And this is us at the Perron Institute. We've just started recruiting. We're sort of in the middle. Tasmania has already recruited quite a few people, but some sites are still waiting approval. So we're really happy with the way that the trial is going so far. So I think that comes to just about the end of my presentation. Um, I'd like to thank you for your attention and also point out that it's MSWA's support through all of the research that we've done from building those miniaturized coils and starting to apply it and asking some questions through basic curiosity that has led to this point. Because if we hadn't had that question, I wonder what happens to those brain cells, I don't think that anybody would ever have thought of applying magnetic brain stimulation to treat multiple sclerosis. So I'd really like to thank MSWA and all of you for your contributions in making this research possible. The final takeaway message then is that translation is really, really important. We need that basic research to lead to benefits in the clinic. And it's only by doing that sort of study, that long translational pathway through meandering and very strange and exciting and interesting research adventures 
that we can drive the innovation that will then lead to better treatments ar across a range of neurological conditions. So in the future, I'd like to think that with our research on TMS looking at a range of different cells, we'll build safety, so that phase one trial, efficacy phase two trials, and all of the basic science evidence based by looking at you know, MRI scans and myelination and that fundamental biological change, and apply not only to things like depression and multiple sclerosis that we know have a lot of potential with magnetic brain stimulation, but also things like stroke, cognitive enhancement eventually, and a lot of neuropsychiatric disorders, including things like autism and attention deficit disorder. So there's a huge range of possibilities as we start to understand the basic neuroscience of how the brain works and how we can harness the, those concepts of brain plasticity to make the brain work in the best possible way. Um, acknowledging our funding sources, obviously, Taurus trial has been supported by a range of different uh, sources and I would also like to thank personally uh, for my funding, MSWA has been absolutely transformative in the work that we've been doing. And my team that has contributed all the way from those little mini coils through to uh, helping out with the trials, you'll meet a lot of them if you come and do the trials at the Perron Institute, really fantastic team. And this is Professor Kayleen Young uh, from Hobart who again made those basic discoveries about the oligodendrocytes. So it takes huge team in the lab and out in the public to make this happen, and thank you very much. Thank you, Jenny. Um, I just want to clarify, Jenny, the trial um, is um, 108. Is that nationally? Or? Sorry, yes, that's nationally. We're looking 20, for 20 participants in Perth. And the age eligibility. The age eligibility? Um, that was done by the, uh, the clinical trials group and the ethics group. So with TMS, we have the best safety evidence from, I think it's 18 to 65, is that correct? 18 to 65. So it's more in terms of the safety criteria and what's known about the safety. And the, uh, this being a phase two trial, we're still going to collect a lot of data about safety. And then once this is complete, we're hoping to then be able to expand it. So all of the eligibility criteria are based around what's known for safety. Yeah. I'm wondering if you think that the effects are permanent or when you have to go back for a top-up. That's an excellent question. And it's one that even the treatments for depression don't understand fully. Because when people receive the MBS approved treatments for depression, they get their four, they often get six weeks sometimes even, and they're generally fine for six to 12 months, but then they will come back for more. And it's generally, it's actually very well accepted now in the depression field that you'll need to come back for a maintenance treatment that might take only two weeks, and then you'll come back again, and it might only be one week, and eventually the maintenance treatments should phase out. It looks like they're going to be phasing out, but it is an ongoing process, but we don't know yet exactly how that works. And individual people seem to respond differently in the depression field. So in MS, if we do find that there is an effect, we're going to have to monitor people long term to make sure that those effects are sustained or we might need to come back and do more. It's an excellent question. And the other thing I was going to ask, uh, the specialist said to me, remyelination might not work for me because I've had it for a very long time um, because the axons are dying. Does this change anything there or not really? The, it's, very, it's very interesting because we know that new oligodendrocytes are born throughout life, so you always get them being born. And the problem, if you don't have a lot of oligodendrocytes, it might just be that they're dying very quickly. And this treatment, we believe, makes them survive for longer. So it could be that by getting magnetic brain stimulation, your oligodendrocytes live longer instead of dying immediately. So. Again, these are questions that we, we just don't know, but what I think is really exciting is that it's making them survive longer. We're not making more of them, we're just making them survive longer. So, I don't know. But it, it doesn't rule anybody out because oligodendrocytes are being produced throughout life. Thank you. Okay. Yep, on the criteria, please. Just a very quick question. Would you actually want a severe case of multiple sclerosis as brain trauma? 
Absolutely, and I think what, what the lady before you was saying about the axons being damaged, that is a trauma, that is a damage to those pathways of the brain. It's like the road's gone, so you need to rebuild new roads, absolutely. I'm talking, sorry, I, I took your question as sort of like a scientific conceptual question, so yes, I do believe conceptually it's an injury. But on the eligibility, it is a trauma as in a concussion or a, a penetrating brain injury. So it, it is a different thing. Yeah. Are we going to die of this disease? <laughs> so I, I can't really answer that question. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. With respect to the um, strength of the magnetic field, have you done any testing on, or do you know the strength of the... Yes. Testing? And does one field, is a strong field, going to be more beneficial or a weaker field? Have you looked into that? Really, really good question. And that's why we built those miniaturized coils, because we wanted to make sure that we could model the field accurately in the brain. If you have a massive coil and you move it just a little bit, the field's going to change dramatically depending on where you are. So having that focal field was really important to us. The field that we're delivering is, um, when it reaches the cortex of the brain, it's about 50 milliteslas, and tesla, so it's very low. The Earth's magnetic field is 19 microteslas. So, and the field that you deliver in depression is 1,000 teslas. So we're somewhere in between the sort of very high intensity treatments that we deliver for depression and the sort of low background magnetic fields in the environment. The, we haven't done a dose response for oligodendrocytes. And this is something that's on the cards. I've actually obtained funding from MS Australia to do a, an incubator project looking at this with a PhD student where we can start to dose, you know, how strong do we need? And we can look at those cells directly um, in a dish. And so it makes it possible to very precisely define how intense the field is. At the moment, we're working based on our uh, preclinical studies. We've exactly translated that field into humans. So we've controlled exactly what the intensity is. A lot of people wanted us to go stronger because that's what's used in depression. But we have the evidence for what we're using. So we very firmly wanted to stick with what we have evidence for. And in the future, maybe more is better, but maybe not. We don't know. So in the studies in relation to depression, obviously, it's just a randomised study. Have they done any correlation? Do any of those people have MS? Have they ever looked into that? I've not seen any papers that specifically ask that question, but in our Taurus 2 trial, one of the questions is about mood. So we're actually actively looking to see if the treatment can improve mood. Obviously, it's, you know, it's, if you're feeling better because your MS is better, I would assume that your mood would be better as well. So it's all sort of entwined. Um, so it's very difficult to disentangle what's going on. Um, but nobody that I'm aware of has actually looked specifically in treatments of depression to see if MS has improved. But I think with this sort of work that we're doing now, as I say, it's really completely new and took the field by surprise. I think a lot of people now will be going back to old data and trying to pull out that information. I think it's very important. Um, I just wanted to ask, the machines that give the treatment, are they ever going to be expensive? So this is another, this is an excellent question. So the machine that I showed you that looks like that desktop computer, those are ones that are um, basically used for depression treatment that have the very high intensity fields. They cost about sixty to seventy thousand dollars. Um, but the fields that we're using in MS, as the lady pointed out before, we're using much weaker fields. And so it would, in theory, be possible to design portable machines that could be used in the home. And these are things that we're exploring because um, it could be that the intensities that we're using for MS might actually work for depression as well. We have a trial ongoing for that, in which case there are huge benefits because you don't need these $70,000 machines. You could build something that was much smaller, much cheaper, and then becomes much more accessible you know, in remote areas and, and things like that. So it's something we are looking into. Hi, just a quick question, Professor. The title of your um, presentation includes an unexpected journey. Um, it's it, it's so exciting what you're saying. Thank um, you. And what you're describing and talking about acts and neurons. It, it, it's up to um, a 
attractive. So for someone like me who has MS and is in, immensely curious, um, I'm, I'm, I've been yearning for um, research that has a participatory um, element to it. And since you, you're talking about an unexpected journey, do you think it could be part of an unexpected journey to have a higher participation um, in, in a research process? Yeah, so one of the things that we're doing in the field of the depression studies that we're, we're looking at is to engage and involve uh, people with lived experience of depression to help to inform how we apply treatments and how we design trials. And the MS involvement in Tasmania has been very, very strong. So they've involved a lot of participants because as I mentioned, that research really originated out of Kayleen's lab and she did the research there. But now that we're running the trials here in Perth, I would love to start to work more closely with people with lived experience to, you know, I'm talking to you about this magnetic brain stimulation and I'm sure some of you are thinking, she's absolutely crazy, I'm not going to get electrical stimulation to my brain. But those are the sorts of things that we want to hear about so that we can communicate better to you and gain your trust in what we're doing with our research to make sure that we're doing things that are useful to you. So uh, please, you've got, I'll, we, let's talk afterwards, I'd love to give you my contact details and hear from anybody else in the audience, so thank you.